Good evening, everyone. Welcome to People's University live stream, Bugs and People. This is our finale, our eighth class in the series that we've all quite enjoyed. And uh, I will introduce our instructor for the evening in just a moment. Just a few announcements. Um, if you'd like to ask a question tonight, you will be entered into a drawing at the end to win uh, a copy of the Kaufman Field Guide to North American Insects, which uh, Eric was the lead author. He will uh, provide one signed copy for one lucky patron, and we will give away three in total. We have two more to give away. Also, stay tuned at the end of the program as we announce the winners for the two manises. We, uh, we had a contest to name our manises, and our staff voted on it. We have the winners that we will announce, and you'll get a restaurant gift certificate. Also at the end, the winner of the Bug Your Pet contest, and of course, the big contest, the winner of the Cicada Art, the multimedia uh, art by Bob Villa Magna uh, of a cicada. Let me, uh, I actually happen to have it right here. So there's what it looks like in the dappled sunlight of the evening in Woodsdale. But there you go. Someone will win that. I wish I could keep it, but I'll have to give it up. Now, uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., when the library opens, you'll be able to meet our newly named Manises, and they'll be publicly visible at the library for the first time. Look for the big OCPL Manis Cam sign. Of course, you can tune in to watch them anytime on our 24-7 Manis Cam, except it gets dark, just like you won't be able to see them after uh, 9 p.m. probably. But uh, this Tuesday uh, at Lunch with Books at noon on the 20th of July, we will have Robert Utley, who is the longtime uh, National Park Service historian and will tell us about the surrender of Sitting Bull that happens to be the exact 140th anniversary of that rather tragic event. And that program is online only, and it's our last Lunch with Books uh, pending current events that will be online. The rest will be in person. We'll also stream them as well if you prefer to stay home. Uh, okay, let's get to our class. Our instructor this evening is Eric Eaton. He is the lead author, as I mentioned, of the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America. He is the author of Wasps, The Astonishing Diversity of a Misunderstood Insect and co-author of Insects Did It First. He's contributed to several other books, has written articles about insects and other animals for Birds and Blooms, Ranger Rick, Missouri Conservationist, and other magazines. He studied entomology at Oregon State University and has worked as a professional entomologist at the Cincinnati Zoo and Chase Studio Incorporated on a private contract for the Smithsonian and University of Massachusetts. As quote unquote Bug Eric online, he has a, a loyal following on social media. Uh, his empathy for squeamish and scared, knack for identification of mystery bugs, and accurate jargon-free explanations of insect biology have made him a leading figular figure in popular entomology. He writes the blogs, Bug Eric and Sense of Misplaced. Here is Eric e. Thank you, Sean. I'm honored by the invitation to participate in this series, and uh, I recognized many of your presenters uh, from previous sessions. And I'm, it's a joy to, to uh, present to everyone online here. Thank you for attending. Well, I'm tasked apparently with uh, the overarching theme of how people relate to insects and the impact that both insects have had on humanity and the impact that humanity has had on insects. So tonight I want to start by talking about that kind of ambivalence we have towards insects, talk about the many positive things that insects have done for, for our civilization and for us as, us as individuals as well. Then I'll talk about pests and more importantly, how we create them. Uh, and then 
we'll go into talking about, well, is there an insect apocalypse? And if so, what can we do about it, about the decline of insects, both in abundance and diversity, and conclude with, with specific things that, that each of us can do to uh, help find a way to coexist with insects. Well, certainly there's plenty of reasons to, to fear insects, frankly. I mean, you, you know, take the mosquito that's on my arm there and mosquitoes can deliver very dangerous diseases from malaria to dengue fever, yellow fever, uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, a lot of very dangerous diseases. West Nile virus is, a, is a one that often makes headlines. So there's, there's plenty of reasons to have a healthy, healthy fear of insects and respect for them. There's many insects we loathe, like the Japanese beetle there in the, in the center picture. They're all over our yard now in Kansas, and I d detest them as much as the next guy. <laughs> <laughs> they don't belong here. That's another story we'll we'll address later. But then there's many insects that that people find fascinating and and beautiful, and and uh, their behaviors are very interesting. Like the the polyphemus moth that is perched there on my friend's hand uh, during a time when we did some black lighting in Arizona. Well, and let's let's talk about moths and butterflies, for example. Uh, a lot of our impressions of insects are part of our growing up, what our parents taught us, what our siblings taught us, their attitudes towards things, what the media uh, tells us we should believe in. Uh, butterflies, like the black swallowtail there on the left, they, they're beautiful, they pollinate flowers, they can do no wrong, right? And meanwhile, their counterparts, the moths, like the, the celery looper, uh, they're, uh, as caterpillars, they're infesting and eating our crops. They're in our closets, eating our clothes. I mean, they can do no right. Uh, but in reality, we conveniently forget that butterflies also come from caterpillars that eat plants. And so here our black swallowtail caterpillar is, is munching on the dill in your garden. It feeds on things in the parsley family. And we we are not aware typically of, of how many moths are actually better pollinators than butterflies are, like the white-lined sphinx moth hovering in front of, of some flowers here. So a lot of our, our what we've grown up thinking about insects is either incorrect or it's you know blatant misinformation or it's just the fact that the entomological community has failed you in providing <laughs> factual information on a regular basis. Our ambivalence towards insects goes way, way back, uh, even into the Bible. You know, for example, you know, Proverbs here, uh, go to the ant thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gather through food in the harvest. And that is exactly what harvester ants do. These are, are common insects across the arid portions of the United States and other and North America in general, actually. And they do just that. They gather grass seed and store it in their underground nests. That and that gets them through periods of drought over the winter, obviously, when when conditions are not favorable. So there's is something to be gleaned uh, from that. There's some truth in 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 the proverbs, but then on the other hand, yeah, at least three or four biblical plagues were insects. So <laughs> you had locusts, of course, being the one that everyone thinks of first. Lice, uh, f biting flies like the uh, mosquito and the stable fly in the upper right hand uh, photo, and then there's pestilence of livestock, which could also be related to insects like this horsefly here. Uh, so God both uh, gives us words of wisdom and then punishes us uh, in, 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 uh, with, with insects as well. Even before that, we had in ancient Egypt, we have had worship of scarabs and many of, of these were described as cults. I don't know if I would go that far, but they certainly deified 
scarab beetles. Their, their sun god, Kefir, uh, took the form of a scarab, it was said, and rolled the sun up in the morning and then down again at night like a big dung ball. Uh, and in reverence for scarabs, they created many beautiful items of jewelry, as we see here from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So our reverence for insects uh, goes goes back hopefully farther than our our our, uh, uh, our fear of them. Well, what what kinds of things do insects do for us today, uh, and and historically, how have they benefited our civilization and and our livelihoods? We get many products from insects. Uh, the honeybee is a good example, and it is not native to the new world. It's only found in Africa, Asia, and Europe. And it was brought to North America in 1622 to Jamestown. And well, why did the settlers do that? Well, the crops they were bringing over, they had no idea whether any of the insects here in, in North America would pollinate them. That's you know, a perfectly reasonable assumption that you wouldn't have insects to deal with crop pollination in some new area you are colonizing. Uh, so they brought honeybee with them. Honeybees also obviously furnish honey, uh, a, a food item, but also beeswax. And beeswax was maybe even more valuable than honey because it was used for candle making and for sealing documents, things of that nature. So three products there of honeybees, well, one being the service, the service of pollination, honey, and then beeswax. Another product we, we derive to this day from insects is silk. And it's commercially produced by one species of insect, the silk moth, Bombyx morii. And the caterpillar stage, uh, it can no longer exist in the wild. It's become so domesticated that it, it is not able to exist in in uh, in the wilds of Asia where it is native to. It feeds exclusively on mulberry leaves. So people that rear these in commercial silk farms must harvest not only the silk that eventually <laughs> comes from the, the life cycle of the insect, but must harvest tons and tons of mulberry to, to feed caterpillars there. As, as we learned in previous sessions, the larval stage is the eating machine, <laughs> eating and growing machine, and it takes a lot of fuel to get it through the entirety of the life cycle. But at the end of it, their final molt is into the pupa stage. And before they become a pupa, they spin cocoons around themselves. And it turns out that, that uh, it was discovered each cocoon is a single strand of silk and can be unwound from the cocoon and then spun into the fabrics that, that uh, we have seen historically and today, very, very fine, durable fabric. Even more importantly, perhaps, than silk itself was the trade in silk and the development of the Silk Road which started back in 126 BC. And it, it went, of course, from China, and it included sea routes as well as overland routes. And not only, of course, was silk traded at this time, but so were other uh, commodities and also philosophy. So you saw religions spreading along the Silk Road as, as well as, as physical commercial products. Another product we get from insects are dyes, and in, in particular, cochineal. Maybe you've been to parts of the United States or elsewhere overseas where you've seen these white fluffy things on cactus pads. Well, uh, each of those is a single insect. It's a type of scale insect, so it's, it's basically immobile and has its mouth parts plugged into the cactus pad and is sucking the sap. And... Part of what the insect does is turn that sap into a defensive compound called carminic acid. And so the carminic acid is, is bright red and you can see it bleeding through the, the white fluff there. The insects also put out this waxy, white waxy secretion to make themselves unpalatable to predators, but also to protect them from the glaring sun. So it's kind of like their own version of, of sunscreen. But these were farmed 
in South America in particular, and the conquistadors discovered this and basically enslaved indigenous peoples to furnish them with these dyes. Today, carminic acid is still used in food coloring. It is probably in the coating of some of the pharmaceuticals you are you take, <laughs> or hopefully you don't need them, but uh, it's it has very versatile properties and we're still discovering what uh, it can do for us. Well, not so common anymore were our inks that we derive from galls and galls are produced, galls are, are plant growths as, as you see in the beaker there. Uh, those are two galls from an oak tree and galls are produced by insects, especially wasps. Those are the ones that produce the galls on oaks primarily. Uh, but other kinds of insects produce galls as well. Mites can produce galls. Different fungi and viruses can also stimulate gall formation. Basically, a gall is a plant growth stimulated by the feeding activity of another organism. And the plant devotes, uh, is, is basically programmed to create this capsule around the insect by its feeding activities and then it is serves as both a home and a food source for the insect developing within. Well, in the case of oak galls, it also concentrates the tannins in a very compact uh, uh, capsule there. And so ground up galls combined with other kinds of, of chemicals were used uh, long ago to produce inks. Here's what uh, galls look like while they're growing. Uh, you probably have seen this if you live anywhere near near uh, oaks in the in the wild anyway, and other plants of course can have galls as well, especially things in the rose family. They can take many other forms. They can be on the leaf. They can be on the stems. These are from from Arizona. Well, lastly, uh, the insect itself can be a product. The practice of of eating insects as part of, of a human diet is called entomophagy. And it's a widespread phenomenon, a cultural phenomena in most parts of the world, save for Europe and North America, uh, where it's still kind of, we can still kind of uh, look at, at entomophagy as kind of a fear factor or on a dare kind of thing. We, we think, well, we've advanced now in our palette to where we're growing things and, uh, you know, have livestock and what have you. Now we have no need for, uh, for feeding on insects, but the more we learn about the nutrient value of insects, the more palatable, if you'll forgive the pun, uh, entomophagy becomes in terms of, of nutrition. And so at, at least as far as, as, uh, at becoming animal feed for livestock, we're starting to explore aspects of entomophagy. It would certainly be a less intensive process to cultivate uh, insects as, as food than it would be uh, other forms of livestock naturally. Well, what else do insects do? Well, they inspire inventions or improvements to existing inventions. Uh, whether or not the origin of paper can be traced to uh, paper wasps like the, the ones here on the nest on the left uh, or whether that came later is a matter of debate. Uh, paper definitely became a thing in Asia, but it was made mostly out of linens and, and you know materials other than wood fibers. It wasn't until there was a paper shortage in France that a, uh, a naturalist who may have been inspired by observing paper wasps caught on to the idea of using wood fibers for the production of paper instead. And so that has kind of, that took hold and is now of course what we make most paper out of today. Ironically, uh, the improvements to the design of chainsaws can also be traced to insects. Uh, a, a logger uh, observed the action of the mandibles of a longhorned beetle larva, like the one in the photo on the right, and saw that the opposing movement of the mandibles 
got the insect through the wood much faster than just a single tooth as would be on the on a chainsaw at that time. And so he redesigned the saw chain as inspired by this beetle larva. And that's traced to uh, an entrepreneur in, in Oregon having observed that. Insects also play a critical role in, in medicine and we're only just scratching the surface of, of what they can do as far as what their potential is as far as pharmaceuticals and, and other things. The, uh, the FDA even uh, approved of the use of fly larvae, for example, as a medical device because fly larvae feed only the, the ones that feed on decaying uh, um, tissues, feed only on decaying tissues and in the process secrete antibiotics and other chemicals that not only retard infection, which is the major, a major problem even in, in hospitals today, but they also promote healing. And so someone with a wound treated with fly larvae often heals faster and does not have the problems with infection than typical bandages and antiseptics have. So the FDA approved those fly lar blow fly larvae as a medical device. Uh, another uh, uh, example is something called apitherapy. And so people actually go and have themselves stung by honeybees, as is ha happening in the photo on the left there. And some people swear by the idea that, that it uh, alleviates joint pain, especially. This is still regarded as alternative medicine. I am not a doctor. I cannot advise you on whether this is a, a, a proven scientifically proven effective treatment or not but as i said some people swear by it and we haven't really fully invested investigating these kinds of of, of therapies on the right hand side we have a firefly fireflies are toxic they have compounds in them known as lucid bufagans, which are related most closely to toad toxins, believe it or not. So please do not lick fireflies. Do not let your kids put them in their mouths. But some of those chemicals have been proven effective against herpes. So again, this is our uh, knowledge of insects as far as the compounds they have that they use in their own defense how that can be applied to medicine and, and other products, still very much in its infancy. Another scientific discipline that insects impact is something called biomimicry. And that is when you have, you modify or create some kind of device that mimics what insects do already or any other animal or plant for that matter. So for example, there's efforts now to make an artificial leaf to uh, produce energy through kind of artificial photosynthesis. Well, uh, here we have an example of a beetle called a fog catching beetle. It lives in the Namib desert in Africa. And at dawn, it climbs to the crest of a dune, leans its body into the wind and the fog rolling off the sea, the Namib desert is a coastal desert. Uh, the fog that rolls in off the sea condenses on the beetle and the droplets run down into its mouth. And so now we're looking at how can we harvest water in a similar fashion in arid regions where, where water is being depleted uh, or is not readily available. Our architecture is also impacted by, uh, or has the the uh, potential anyway, to be impacted by mimicking the architecture of uh, insect nests. For example, termites uh, in Africa and other tropical regions will build these enormous mounds that are mostly uh, shafts for air conduction. So they basically have a built-in air conditioning system no electricity required. So maybe in the future, we will have our buildings uh, air conditioned without having to power them up just by uh, the way we get air into and out of a building. A lot of potential uh, in architecture and other engineering disciplines through biomimicry. 
Well, lastly, uh, insects provide services that we don't tend to think of uh, as services. They're called ecosystem services. And these include pollination, like the longhorn beetle on the flower in the lower left there. Natural pest control, like the ichneumon wasp that is stinging a uh, caterpillar and laying an egg inside that caterpillar. Waste disposal, like the dung beetle rolling away the, uh, the uh, poo of a prairie dog there in the lower, uh, lower center. And food for other wildlife. So maybe you don't like insects themselves, but you do like birds and you do like lizards like this gecko. Uh, and insects certainly feed them. So even if you don't like insects, <laughs> there's something to be said for feeding other forms of wildlife. Well, in the early 2000s, uh, scientists and went about calculating, for North America at least, how much can we assign a monetary value to these ecosystem services. And it turns out that just in the, the services, these four services, it's about $57 billion, that's billion with a B, annually is provided by insects but you know you don't hear about that typically you hear about how many billions of dollars in damage they do to crops and livestock and our human health so there is a balance sheet and here's the other side of it it's called ecosystem services so we typically think of of, of bees as major pollinators we think of honeybees first because they're used in agriculture and our agriculture is at a scale where it's dependent on on honeybees rather than our native bees. But we have hundreds of species of native bees that live solitary lives, each female making her own nest and providing it, providing her offspring with loaves of pollen and nectar that they collect from flowers. And so like the leaf cutter bee here on the left is going to make its her nest in a pre-existing cavity. She's gonna divide it into different cells that she partitions with, in this case, leaf part, parts we also have butterflies that are pollinators, but so many other insects are also pollinators. Many flies are pollinators. And so some of those flowers that don't smell so sweet to us uh, <laughs> are very attractive to flies and they'll pollinate them. And, and of course, night blooming flowers are pollinated mostly by moths, sometimes bats as well. So pollination is a huge service. We found, for example, that blueberries are best pollinated, not by honeybees, but by native mason bees that nest uh, similar, in a similar fashion to the leafcutter bees there. And some plants have only one pollinator that they're dependent upon. And, it, and the yucca moth is the classic example of this. The female moth harvests pollen uh, from one yucca flower, transports it to the next flower, pounds it into the pistil manually. So she's stuffing pollen into the flower to make absolutely sure it's fertilized. Then she lays her egg at the base of that pistil into the ovaries of the flower. And her caterpillars will feed on the seeds of the plant, but not consume all of them. And so in the process of feeding her offspring, she also fertilizes the plant and ensures that there'll be another crop of yuccas in the future. But there's many other partnerships like this that are called oligolectic pollinators, where the pollinator pollinate is only one plant and the plant is likewise dependent solely on that one insect. Well, we, we also have insects doing natural pest control. In this case, we have aphids under assault by all kinds of predators. On the left, we have an aphid lion, a very grotesque looking uh, insect larva that will uh, make up for its youthful appearance by becoming a green lacewing, a very delicate and beautiful insect that you're likely to see at your porch light tonight if you turn it on. In the center, we have cer certain surfid flies or flower flies, as, as they're more commonly known, hover flies in the, if you're in the United Kingdom. And the larvae of many species of those uh, feed on aphids as well, sometimes two at a time, as the one <laughs> in the bottom center photo is doing. And of course, ladybugs, which are a kind of beetle. And here we have three different species of lady beetle in the far right photo uh, feasting 
on, on aphids. But it doesn't stop there. There's other in, still other insects that attack aphids. Here we have a tiny, tiny wasp that lays her her lays an egg inside an aphid. And in the center photo, you see two healthy aphids at the top of the photo. And at the bottom photo, you have an aphid mummy. And so inside there is her off, a single larval offspring of that wasp. And when it becomes a mature wasp itself, it'll pop its way out of that aphid mummy. And on the right hand, you have right hand photos, you have caterpillars that have been overtaken by parasitoid wasps as well. Those are not eggs on that caterpillar, but the cocoons are very tiny wasps, their mother having laid uh, eggs inside that caterpillar. We would be up to our necks in dung and other waste products if it weren't for insects. And so you have things like dung beetles, not all of which roll away dung balls like, like those three there in the picture on your left, but some that dig under a pat of dung and drag the, the, the dung underground away from competing uh, animals. Then you have things like the golden dung fly uh, on top of a piece of horse manure there. And uh, her larvae will grow up eating the dung too. We also have insects that take care of decomposing animal matter, uh, carcasses and what have you, from carrion beetles like the one on the left there to blowflies, of course, on the right. And they uh, make quick work of dispatching of, of, uh, of carcasses that would otherwise spread filth and disease. Even termites and cockroaches <laughs> left to their own devices in nature are are crucial to the decomposition and, and re-nutrification, if that's a word, <laughs> of soil uh, and fostering the growth of new plant matter. And so subterranean termites, like the ones there on the, on the left, consume all manner of cellulose with the help of, of uh, microbes in their tummies. And cockroaches consume all kinds of, of decaying matter from plant to animal. And as I mentioned previously, if you like other wildlife, well, mo much of it depends on insects uh, for growth and development. And so uh, you have a, bl a Western bluebird there uh, with a grasshopper and a Western meadowlark over there with a, a big caterpillar. And that's what they're going to feed their nestlings on because they're high in protein and fat. And you can quickly uh, graduate your offspring to, to fledgling status that way. Here we have a flycatcher with a moth on the left and a hairy woodpecker that has harvested carpenter ants that it will feed to its young. Even mammals feed on insects. Bats, of course, like the big brown bat on the, on the left, uh, are wholly dependent upon insects uh, at, for their diet. That's why they're called insectivores. Shrews are another example of insectivores. Armadillos. Anteaters, of course, many, the arter wolf of, uh, of Africa. So a lot of different kinds of, of mammals make use of, of insects, even bears like the grizzly bear. Well, how's that possible? You say, well, uh, in the, the Yellowstone ecosystem during the summer, food is very scarce. And so bears will go up into uh, alpine scree and turn over boulders to find these. These uh, moths are army worm moths, and they gather by the millions under boulders in high elevations to endure the hot summers before they would fly back down and lay their eggs in the fall. And so the bears have learned that this is a great source of, of again, fat and protein, and they will turn over boulders and lick the moths off uh, and get themselves through the hot food scarce summer. Fish, of course, eat insects too, and not only that, but we eat fish, and so it's it, the, the whole circle of life there. And aquatic insects do even more than that. They're great indicators of water quality. Uh, for example, the mayfly naiad on the left there, or the caddisfly larva uh, on the right that has built a uh, case uh, out of uh, debris there, they are great indicators 
of the health of your of your water systems, water ecosystems. And scientists, in fact, uh, have the EPT uh, um, index of water quality, and and the E stands for Ephemeroptera, the order of mayflies. P for Plecoptera, the order of stoneflies, and T for Trichoptera, the, the order for caddisflies. So the more variety you have of these organisms within a given watershed or lake uh, is a good indicator of water quality. The, the less uh, diversity you have, the poor your situation there. Well, we've talked about the positive aspects of, of, of insect life. What about you know, pests. I mean, we can't talk about human interactions with, with insects without addressing that. But what is often not talked about is how we create them. And in nature, there aren't any pests. There are no, there is no such thing as ownership, for example. And so um, our, our mindset as human beings, our economic mindset says, well, you know, anything that competes for our resources must be a pest and so that's how we frame any competing animal and we or organism in general frankly and uh, and how we treat it accordingly so basically our first way of creating pests is to cultivate a mindset that this thing is a pest they are because we say they are like wasps well social social wasps in particular we are what we have most of our interactions with but you know, well over 90% of wasp species are solitary. So each female, like that leafcutter bee I was talking about earlier, each female has her own nest, or maybe she doesn't have any nest at all. She just injects her egg into a host. Uh, but the wasps that we interact with <laughs> too often are the social wasps that are raiding our barbecues and picnics and what have you, or that we bump into uh, their nest in the course of of our own activities and outpour all these hornets and uh, yellow jackets and paper wasps out to get us here. There are arguably other insects that that we can't tolerate because they do damage to our yards and gardens and, and crops. And so the Japanese beetle is, a, uh, is one that will devastate your rose bushes and grapevines and all manner of other plants. It is a sod pest in its larval state. On the other hand, you have earwigs and, and oriental beetles, likewise not native, uh, that, that may devastate your garden as well. And that brings us to, well, <laughs> this idea we never think of the flip side of it where you know we are providing resources to other organisms. It really is a circle of life. And uh, if we can get to a point where we can laugh at something like this, uh, the fact that, yes, we sometimes provide our blood to other organisms or other material goods to them. Well, okay, that's just the way it is. You know, nothing is off limits in the world of nature. I was going to say that, that having jumped uh, 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 back to from into the uh, Japanese beetle and the European earwig, most of our pests are things that do not belong here in the first place. We have imported them by intention or accident, and then they have gone wild because they don't have any natural predators or parasitoids or, or um, uh, diseases that affect them. And the list goes on and on. Uh, the ones that you have probably heard of are the emerald ash borer, the top left photo, uh, which is devastating ash trees, especially in urban areas now, and so they're preemptively removing them. The gypsy moth below that, the larvae can consume over 300 different kinds of plants. So when you have a generalist feeder like that, it's hard for hard not to consider it a pest. Fire ants, uh, the insects themselves sting, but their mounds can damage farm equipment. So they're, they're a pest in, in a couple of different ways there. More recently, we have the spotted lantern fly in the upper right-hand corner. The adult is on top of the branch. The baby or nymph is on the side of the branch there. They look radically different depending on your life, the life stage you're looking at. Becoming a very widespread pest in the Northeast that attacks a number of different crops, 
sucks the sap out of trees and, and shrubs. And then in the bottom right, you have the so-called murder hornet or Asian giant hornet, which has been detected on numerous occasions now in the Pacific Northwest of Washington State and British Columbia, Canada. Well, another uh, aspect of, of pests is that the scale of our agriculture is so great, uh, it feeds pests and, and starves biodiversity. <clears throat> when you have a field acre upon acre upon acre of potatoes, for example, you're going to have Colorado potato beetle and other insects that are specialists on feeding on just potato. And you're going to have no reservoir in sight for natural enemies of these insects. Likewise, if you plant a whole, you know, fields, acres and acres of corn, you're going to have things like the western corn rootworm, the larva of this beetle feeding on the roots, and then corn earworm, the caterpillar stage of the moth feeding on the ears, developing ears of corn. And again, that scale of agriculture has created an addiction to chemical pesticides which in turn create new pests and kill beneficial organisms that, that would help in pest control if we let them. But when you, again, when you have acre upon acre of, of a given crop, this is basically your only recourse. In Europe, they're starting to return to kind of a smaller scale and, uh, you know, looking again at hedgerows between crops that can serve as reservoirs for for everything from birds to foxes to of course all the parasitoid insects the pollinators and things that will benefit your crop as well as you benefiting them by providing them for for housing but at this point our primary response to pests is chemical insecticides well what happens when you do that well we tried spraying the boll weevil, a cotton pest, into oblivion in the south. And in when we did that, we succeeded in, in suppressing the boll weevil only to have the tobacco budworm become a cotton pest. Uh, and this kind of scenario has been repeated many times throughout history, uh, with mosquitoes even, where we sprayed in one habitat thinking we're, we were getting rid of, of a disease-carrying mosquito only to have another one take its place. So this is kind of what we call a pesticide treadmill where we can't ever seem to get ahead of a given pest because it either becomes resistant to insecticides or we've succeeded in suppressing that only to have another pest come into uh, to take its place. And of course, how what we do in agriculture trickles down to what we do in our residential communities, our, our suburbs, our even our urban areas where we have we treat with pesticides because we have acres and acres of lawns, um, or we have arboretums and, and uh, landscaping that we that often incorporates exotic trees that don't do well in the climate we've planted them and they're more susceptible therefore to pests, which we then treat with insecticides. And then we're also prone to media influence about how we treat insects. Uh, spoiler alert, the uh, sonic pest control uh, device there has zero effect on insects for sure. I can't speak to rodents, but I suspect it's not very effective on them either. So buyer beware. Well, have, have we, in the process of pest control, we created an insect that apocalypse uh you know what else have we done if anything to spur insect declines one of the whether or not there isn't an insect apocalypse depends a little bit on who you ask sometimes scientists will say well your anecdotal evidence like how many insects are on your radiator grill or your how many splatters are on your windshield is not a good indication of insect abundance or diversity. Uh, we need scientific data collecting uh, to have an accurate assessment. And this is true. But the problem is we haven't devoted any resources to making those baseline data points. We've poured all our 
our, all our uh, money into what? Economic entomology, pest control, and, and things of this nature. So we haven't talked, we haven't even thought about, well, you know, maybe we should get a good idea of how many different kinds of insects and how many of each there are to begin with, and then, then monitor that over time. We just haven't done that. It's been amateur entomologists and amateur naturalists who have done that, and now that is treated as anecdotal evidence of an insect apocalypse. Uh, but what we do know is that, that there are things that could contribute to a decline of insects, and they're on a pretty massive scale, all of them. One is habitat destruction. When I lived in Colorado, this was uh, a landfill uh, up the hill from our home that uh, had, re had uh, kind of self-restored to some semblance of a, of a natural prairie, the high plains there. This is what they should look like. This is what that area looks like now. It's going to be a new housing development. Um, before this happened, I had, cal I had uh, discovered about well over 700 species of animal life living there from birds to reptiles to insects, um, all of it gone now, obviously. Uh, so, you know, you have hopefully not witnessed this kind of thing yourself, but you probably have. Uh, urban sprawl and the, the footprint of, of human enterprise in general, uh, destroying a lot of habitat in the process. A bigger issue is climate change and, and global warming. Uh, what kinds of impacts do those cause? Well, I think we've seen the heat waves and, and in the case in Colorado and, and in the West, rampant wildfires, some of the largest in history, uh, some of the most intense, and happens year after year after year. So you're losing a lot of habitat that takes time to regrow. And you're also seeing as a result of temperature changes, even minor uh, changes like, you know, one or two degrees can drive Arctic inhabiting or high elevation inhabiting species like this Arctic butterfly, uh, it's called an Arctic, by the way, <laughs> um, to points where they have nowhere else to go. Uh, it gets too warm, and so they'll, they'll die off because their host plant will not be able to take the temperature changes either. And we're already seeing this kind of phenomenon, this uh, elevational uh, phenomena happening, and it's it's well documented scientifically for sure. Continued use of pesticides, uh, uh, again, you know, and it's and it's not a localized thing. Remember that when you spray in one place, it may not stay there. It uh, may drift on the wind if it's an aerial application, especially. Uh, it'll certainly leach into groundwater or run off with the rains into water courses. It can be drawn back out from wells. So you have the potential of poisoning human populations as well as, as wildlife in natural habitats. Uh, so using pesticides has a lot of, of what you would call collateral damage or have the potential for a lot of collateral damage. One thing that doesn't get a lot of attention is light pollution. Uh, and th this has an impact in a number of ways. It can be as, as, as uh, you know, seemingly uh, the least impactful being the glow of a distant city. Uh, it, it still, you know, represents an incremental increase in light to direct illumination uh, of, of sidewalks or businesses. And this, in fact, this impacts not only nocturnal insects like fireflies, which obviously can't compete with the, the glow of, of our artificial lights. Uh, it, it attracts moths, which then can't find mates because they've been drawn away from that mission of finding a mate. Uh, but it also affects day active insects, which uh, extends their period of activity and thereby diminishes their lifespan because they're not getting the periods of, of rest that they normally would get. But there are things that we can do to curb these impacts that we have and, and help restore insect diversity and abundance. 
uh, again, in Colorado, forgive me for, <laughs> but um, for spotlighting one particular, particular state, but, but when I lived there, I went through the Habitat Hero garden program and learned about how we can plant with natives and, in, and you know, landscape our areas with native vegetation and reduce uh, the potential for invasive plant species by doing that and also by providing uh, plants that are more beneficial to the insects that live in that area. So for example, you know, a lot of these, the plants that are, we landscape with now are native to some other country or some other continent in most cases. Uh, well, how long does it take a native to be, or a non-native rather, to become native? Well, the answer in most cases is never. Uh, you know, some of these plants in this graphic here have been uh, in North America for 100, 200, or 300 years, and very few species, if any, of, of uh, insects have adapted to feed on them. So you have these completely, uh, you know, vacuous plants, basically, in terms of their contribution to our native uh, fauna. They just don't make one. They're aesthetically pleasing, maybe, uh, if you have, if you're, uh, your beauty uh, is your primary concern, but they have no utilitarian value to anything else but us in, in that case. So what do we do instead? Well, uh, we're learning that not only should we be planting native vegetation, but certain kinds of plants that are called keystone host plants. And in, in the case for the majority of, of, of uh, North America, Eastern North America in particular, oak is, is the plant or the tree really that, that, that gets the most attention from insects, especially caterpillars that turn into moths and butterflies uh, and that in turn feed the birds and other wildlife, as we talked about in, in ecosystem services. Uh, so it all starts with what you plant and then the kinds of insects that feed on that and then the other kinds of wildlife that feed on those insects. So you're by changing your landscape to incorporate native plants, you are doing a global service because you're feeding migrant birds, for example, that, that may just be passing through your neighborhood, but they're going to be breeding north of you. They're going to be wintering in, in Central or South America. Uh, you know, think of it as an international initiative <laughs> when you're you're thinking about how to landscape your property or how to landscape your city. If you have the power to talk about urban, um, you know, districts and parks and things of that nature. And also think about maybe not using pesticides, but using something more harmonious with the with the ecosystem or at least uh, something that is built for just the singular task, like the fly swatter. Uh, <laughs> so you can make an impact in your consumer choices as well as, as in your, your landscaping choices. And back to landscapes though for a minute, this is our new house in Kansas. We, we just moved in in May. We have too big a lawn. Okay. You know, we want to get rid of that lawn, turn it into something that, approximates more of a prairie while still being uh, acceptable to the neighborhood. <laughs> uh, we're investigating how to do that now, uh, but fortunately there's a lot of, of uh, online help and uh, the Native Plant Society in your uh, state uh, can help you also choose plants that are appropriate for your area and convert lawnscapes, as I like to call them, into landscapes that are more in, in uh, more complementary to your native habitats. You can also provide housing for insects. You can buy uh, insect hotels or what they call bee condos or bee blocks. Uh, you can buy them or make them yourself is even better. Just drill holes of varying diameters into uh, blocks of wood or logs and hang them up, usually in a south facing direction or an east facing direction, the, the different diameters will attract different kinds of insects. Uh, do they work? Yes, definitely. Um, we hung a bee block up in, in, in our very tiny uh, Colorado townhouse yard and got 
leaf cutter bees there on the left that were pollinating the flowers and making their nests in there. And then we've got mason wasps like this one on the right that were, were uh, paralyzing caterpillars and, and stuffing them in these, these uh, slots for their, their own larval offspring to feed on. So yes, they do work. Uh, do make sure you do it correctly. And again, there are a lot of online resources to do that. I'll talk about one of them in a minute. Become a bug watcher. Uh, it's, it, you know, we got plenty of bird watchers, birders as they like to be called now, and rightly so. We need more bug watchers. It's not too difficult. Uh, maybe you'll want to have a field guide, uh, part of the product placement there, uh, to help you identify what you're looking at. Close focusing binoculars that will focus somewhere between seven and 10 feet will help you get good looks at butterflies and dragonflies and other things that don't sit still very long. Maybe a telescope if you want to watch a hornet nest. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, a camera to help you record what you see, or even your phone these days can probably take better pictures than the, than the camera I have. Or a magnifier glass to look at, at things that are really tiny. Uh, and then you can... Uh, Participate in social events. Coincidentally, National Moth Week is this coming week. And typically that takes the form of public or private events where you hang out a sheet and put a black light in front of it and a white light. And the white light attracts things that are reflected. You know, the white light reflects off the sheet, broadcasts to the moths in the neighborhood, and then the black light holds them there and you can, can see all the diverse kinds of, of moths and other insects that live in your area. And I realized I just talked about light pollution, <laughs> but this is a one week event and it's a great way to familiarize yourself with the, the fauna that should be in your area. And another thing that people do is they paint a bait onto tree trunks and typically that's fermented beer, molasses, maybe overripe banana mashed up there. They paint it on the, Age it for a day or two, paint it on the trunk of a tree, and insects that don't come to the light will come to these baits. It's called sugaring. We recommend you do not do that in areas where there are bears. And when you are watching insects, you can record your observations on a number of different websites. Uh, iNaturalist is, is the one I use most frequently now uh you can you don't have to know what the thing is you can just put it up there it's an insect i know that much and someone will come along and say okay it's this thing sometimes that takes a while <laughs> but someone will answer you eventually bugguide.net uh, lower left there uh, is another resource that's probably the most comprehensive online guide to insects anywhere it's tuned to canada and the united states uh but there are probably other resources elsewhere, I would hope, that, that can help you identify insects in other parts of the world. Project NOAA is, a, is very much like iNaturalist. It might be a little more kid-friendly. Uh, lots of, even if you don't contribute, it, the, it's fun to browse these websites and look at what other people are seeing. And you can look up your own location basically in there and see what people are seeing nearby. And lastly, uh, we have the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. It was founded in the 1970s, uh, named after the only, at that time, the only known butterfly that had been rendered extinct by humans. Uh, the Xerces Blue in the Bay Area of California. Uh, but they do all kinds of, of work, scientific-based research and outreach to help in insect conservation. And this includes pollinators other than butterflies, includes aquatic insects, forest insects in particular. They're based in Portland, Oregon, but I recommend checking out their website, xerces.org. Uh, they have ways you can set up bee blocks and plant and landscape for pollinators. So it's a good resource as well as, as the fact that they're doing uh, work not only in the United States, by the way, but overseas as well. And with that, I want to say, remember, give blood. It saves lives. Uh, but I also <laughs> want to thank, again, thank Sean for inviting me to present. I want to thank my mentors,
past, present, and future. I don't come by all the knowledge I have through self-study. I know a lot of people who know a lot more than I do. My wife, Heidi, for putting up with me and being my tech guru, uh, the Creative Commons image providers for many of the images that you saw here that I could not possibly have gotten on my own. And lastly, thanks to all of you for watching. I hope you will take what uh, what you've learned through these sessions and and uh, and go out and have fun and and hopefully uh, learn more just in the processes of exploring yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Excellent program. Um, Thanks for providing the capstone that I thought was uh, very appropriate for what we did uh, during this series. Um, so we have a few questions, and then we're going to give away some prizes. Uh, let me start with this one. I think you kind of covered that, but let's just repeat. I'm only seeing half the question. Entomologist most useful is all I'm seeing. Okay, let me read it to you. Uh, birders have binoculars. What is an entomologist most useful tool? Ah, oh, outstanding question. Um, powers of observation, I think, probably. Um, it, it, it's, it's funny because I will go out with birders and they will see an eagle on the horizon and I'm like, I don't see anything. So <laughs> it, it takes time to develop a search image for anything that you're out looking for. But so maybe your best asset is, is a mentor or, or someone you, uh, you can go into the field with a good, well-rounded naturalist. I, I often will go out with people who know about plants or uh, reptiles or something. And that's often only the, the only way I learn to, to find them is by going out with others who know more. That's a good answer. Um, I know you were looking for my approval, by the way. Uh, <laughs> here's another one uh, regarding uh, I'm going to put it up regarding bug repellent sprays are they harmful obviously harmful to bugs possibly but what about humans well uh, I would as, as far as repellents I would consult a physician uh, and see what they say I mean, yeah. you know, your your body chemistry may be different from the next person, so that's a that's a really important consideration. But as far as impacting insects, um, repellents do just that. They repel. They don't exterminate. They're not a pesticide. They're designed to interfere with the senses of, of insects that would otherwise bite us or land on us or land on a particular plant or whatever, uh, because Insects perceive the world in a very chemotactile fashion. That's taste and touch, the, you know. And so, anything you put out there uh, that interferes with with either touch or taste is is going to repel them. <laughs> okay, I will say, and I I won't mention the the brand, but I was at a music festival last weekend. Used a brand, a popular brand of insect repellent, and still got four very prominent mosquito bites. So I don't know. Is it possible? And I, I had this question. Is it possible that insects uh, evolve to not be repelled? Does that even make sense? Yeah. Um, well, we, we certainly know that insects can become resistant to pesticides, right. uh, th which, which makes sense, especially with insects that are herbivores, because Remember, plants already have toxins in them that are built strictly to, to mess with insects' digestive systems. So another, you throw another chemical at an insect that eats plants, and it's like, okay, well, I can find a way around this. I found a way around the, the, the plant's natural defenses. Uh, when, it, when it comes to other, you know, other organisms other than plants, it's a little more complicated than that probably. Um, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, here's another one. Other than silkworms, are there any instances of insects that are now domesticated to the point where they cannot survive in the wild? Uh, not that I am aware of. As far as I know, the, the silkworm is the only 
species that's that's now dependent on humans. Uh, you know, even honeybees uh, are they're very well managed, but they do swarm and become feral. Uh, you know, kind of like wild horses in a way. Um, but yeah, as far as I know, most other insects can survive whether or not they're managed by people. Okay. Are there insects that are being genetically modified to become more beneficial? And are they insects themselves evolving to become more resistant? Oh, I already asked that question, but uh, modified, genetically modified. What about that? Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any research that's trying to make like robo bug or any, you know, otherwise, you know, enhance the, you know, the biology of an existing beneficial insect. That's a, that's an interesting concept. I don't, I, I think if anybody were to do that, it would be, well, can we make them more effective in a, managed agricultural system, in which case it would be a less mobile insect probably. So for example, when you buy uh, lady beetles at the nursery and you release them into your yard, they're mostly gonna fly away into other people's yards. (laughs) Okay, so maybe if you wanted to genetically modify them to be less dispersal oriented, uh, that would be a way to do it. But I I don't know of any research into that right now. There is uh, research into constantly ongoing research into how to, uh, you know, mess with insects in their metamorphosis, especially through imitating their growth hormones and things of this nature. Uh, So, you know, how do we make a mosquito less, uh, less of a host for a plasmodium or some other disease organism, for example? So, that kind of resource research I think is, is going to be very beneficial where you're not, you know, you're not shooting the messenger, for example, you're, you're just making it less hospitable to its disease organism or, you know, a lot of insects spread viruses to plants too. So how do we make them less able to, to host a virus? Okay. So kind of the other, the opposite uh, way. Um, you mentioned the insect apocalypse. Here, the question here is: Are are we seeing declining insects with climate uh, climate change or warming? Um, yes, I I, I I I personally think that's unequivocal. Uh, I mean, I realize that I'm you know going by relatively anecdotal evidence myself, uh, but the. It, it's, it's also hard to ascertain right now because we're seeing weather events of, of such dramatic intensity and such dramatic fluctuations from high and low and drought and deluge that it's hard to now to get a baseline because there isn't any average. Uh, there's only these extremes going on. Uh, one, one observation I have made, which is troubles me a little bit, is that a lot of insects have parasitic mites on them. Uh, Up until about three or four years ago, I wouldn't see too many insects with mites on them. Now I see uh, two or three mites on on about every other insect. So mite loads on insects are going up and I don't think that's a healthy trend. Uh, Parasitic mites suck the hemolymph out of insects and so diminish their lifespan their ability to find mates, that kind of thing. So I think there's evidence, you know, obliquely indicating that 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 stuff is going on that is probably related to climate change. I don't really see any other uh, influence that could account for that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I will modify this one slightly. Other than mosquitoes, what is the most dangerous insect in North America? Most dangerous insect. Um, oh, that has more to do with with the individual person than it than it does the insect. I mean, if you happen to be hypersensitive to insect venom, for example, a single bee sting could be a life threatening experience. Uh, I I don't really think you can uh, quantify that really. Uh, you know, everybody has their own body 
chemistry and own particular immune system that is going to react differently to different insects. But certainly, yeah, the mosquitoes, yeah, if you want to legitimately fear any insect, that would be it. Um, there, there are kissing bugs that you hear about a lot in the headlines. Um, so far, <laughs> fingers crossed, uh, they don't seem to be good vectors for Chagas disease, which is good because if you, if you don't detect Chagas disease right away, and it's a very difficult disease to diagnose, uh, it's almost always fatal. Uh, so, and, and the, again, the kissing bug is a, a type of blood feeding assassin bug from you know, found principally in the southern United States, uh, as far north as southern Ohio. Uh, but, uh, you know, yeah. So some of your blood feeding insects, aside from mosquitoes, can, can potentially be dangerous, yes. All right. Uh, uh, related to that, since you mentioned uh, they're not really insects, but uh, do, do bug sprays, are they effective against ticks? You've stumped the expert. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I like to, I kind of like to steer clear from that, to be honest with you. Uh, I, um, I don't typically wear repellents. Sometimes I pay the price for that. <laughs> right. uh, it's how I get good pictures of mosquitoes and ticks. But <laughs> um, I, uh, any, anything with DEET as its principal ingredient uh, over like, you know, 30%. Is going to be pretty effective in repelling most insects. Um, if uh, I've heard that, and, and I've tried this myself, I've tried dusting the cuffs of my pants and my shoes with uh, sulfur, powdered sulfur, and that does help repel chiggers, uh, which are obviously more of an annoyance than they are a health threat. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would consult before I consult a corporate website. Though I would consult your you know your county extension agent or the cooperative extension service is, is uh, the umbrella under which everybody fits. Uh, consult them and see what they have to say about it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, two hum humorous or silly questions before we get uh, give away our big prizes. The first one is, if bird watchers are birders, are bug watchers buggers? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't given enough thought to that. <laughs> um, I think that's that's funny. I, I can I can laugh at that. Um, I I say bug watchers, but uh, um, yeah, let's go bug watchers. Yeah, let, let's start with that and see where it goes. How's that? Okay. <laughs> There's another humorous one. Uh, are be are bees needed to pollinate cannabis? And if so, do they get high? <laughs> Oh my, um, you'd think having lived in Colorado, I would know the answer to this. I, I don't even know what pollinates cannabis. Honest, I have no idea. Um, Every insect that pollinates, pollinates cannabis, I'm guessing. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think they get a buzz out of it, uh, pun intended there. Yeah, there you go. That's why you're bug, Eric. Okay, uh, Eric, Great presentation. Thank you. And thanks for being a good sport. And uh, this is the first program, I think, that we, uh, may, other than maybe Dr. Evans, uh, the second Dr. Evans, that did not have a technical glitch. So excellent way to end. It shows that we've mastered this, I think, sort of on some level. So, okay. With that said, if you want to stick around, we're going to give away prizes now. And first three copies of this book. And by the way, when I was a kid, there was no book I liked better than a field guide. You know, I really loved these. Whatever animal it was, or plant even, uh, a field guide was essential, and I, I loved them. Uh, and this one is the Kaufman Field Guide to North America, to Insects of North America that our friend Eric was the primary author on. So let's draw the first winner. And the first winner is the one that gets the sign book. And that goes to a gentleman named Wayne Carey. Wayne, send us a message with your uh, mailing address and we'll get that out to you. Okay, the second book, Kaufman Guide. 
goes to Jean Finstein, who asked the question about the buggers. <laughs> so she can answer the question herself. And the third and final copy of the Kaufman Field Guide goes to Carolyn. Carolyn Ziegler, our friend. Uh, you've won a copy of, of the Field Guide. Okay. Now, the next category of winners is the uh, Mantis Name Contest. Now, we had uh, dozens of entries, and a lot of them were excellent. Uh, so what we did was Nate, who's our man of sky at the library, myself and Aaron picked our favorites and then we let the staff choose their favorite two. For the brown manis, the winner was, and I'm very happy about this, Fiona. Uh, Liam, our friend Liam Donahue, who watches a lot of our programs, this young man, I think, wanted to name the Manus after his sister, and so he has done so. And he's won a gift certificate to a local restaurant. So the brown Manus will be, will be named Fiona, officially. The uh, green Manus will, will be named Phaedra. And again, Carolyn was the, uh, chose that name, so she's won another prize tonight. So Phaedra and Fiona, those are our Manuses. I think they're good choices. As for the Bug Your Pet contest, we don't have a lot of entries because apparently people did not want to put costumes on their pets, which is probably a good idea. But the winner was Kevin the Cat, and his human is Susan Hagen. And let me see if I can put up a picture of Kevin so you can see why we chose Kevin. Yeah, there he is. Uh, Kevin did not like being dressed like a bug. And I think we had a certain amount of respect for his resistance to authority, and that's why he won. So congratulations, and you've won. Kevin will win something, as will Susan, uh, another gift certificate. Um, and our final big prize, of course, is the Cicada Art by Bob Villa Magna. And if you go here to this, just go to our website and search for uh, Cicada I think that'll get you to the pictures, the full gallery. There were about 30 entries. And I want to thank everyone who did that. And I'm going to draw the winner now from the official bag, which has the, the cicada on it. There it is. I've been, sh I've been shaking this up all night, so it's, it's well mixed. And I've just chosen the winner. So let's see who won the skate. Very exciting. I wish I could keep it myself, but I can't. Gene Finstein is the winner. Okay, Gene, you did very well tonight. You win the Bob Villa Magna artwork. And Eric, thank you again for being good sport and for uh, being the instructor for our final class. And I want to thank you. Any of the other instructors who happen to be watching, I want to thank you all. That was one of the best series we've ever done. Congratulations to all the winners. Thank you all for attending. And we'll see you Tuesday for Robert Utley, uh, The Surrender of Sitting Bull. Goodbye, everyone.